Good evening. I'm Fiona Branton, president of the Harvard Law School Forum, and I'd like to welcome you all here tonight for our first event of the spring 1988 season. We're very pleased to have with us tonight Mary Beth Whitehead Gould and her attorney, Harold Cassidy. Before we get started, I'd like to say a few words about the remainder of our spring schedule. Our next event will be next Thursday, February 18th at 8 p.m. in Austin North when we present Joyce Brown, the New York City homeless woman who successfully challenged Mayor Koch's new policy for dealing with the homeless by committing them to institutions. She will be joined by her attorney, Norman Siegel, who is the executive director of the New York Civil Liberties Union. Ms. Brown will address homelessness from the street perspective, while Mr. Siegel will discuss the legal issues involved with helping the homeless. It promises to be an enlightening discussion. The rest of our schedule includes Eleanor Smeal, the former president of the National Organization for Women on March 1st, Irma Bombeck on March 15th, Polster Lewis Harris on April 18th, HLS alum and our author Scott Turo on April 25th, and Washington Post reporter and author Bob Woodward on April 28th. We hope to be announcing two or three additional events shortly. Tonight's format will consist of remarks by Mrs. Whitehead Gould and Mr. Cassidy, then followed by questions from the audience. If you'd like to ask questions, we'd ask you to line up on either side of the room to use the microphones, and then we'll alternate sides. Uh, introducing Mrs. Whitehead Gould tonight is Harvard Law School professor Martha Field. Professor Field is currently in her 10th year of teaching here, specializing in constitutional law, federal courts, and family law. She has just completed a book on surrogate motherhood. I'm pleased to present Professor Field. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to introduce Mrs. Mary Beth Whitehead Gould tonight and Mr. Harold Cassidy. We have them to thank for bringing us last week's uh, decision of the New Jersey Supreme Court holding paid surrogacy is illegal and unenforceable in, uh, in New Jersey. Many surrogate mothers have not wanted to turn over their new baby, but it took Mrs. Whitehead Gould fighting on this issue to establish their right not to be bound by the contract. In this way, Mrs. Whitehead Gould might be compared to Rosa Park, who insisted on riding in the front of the bus and thereby helped us achieve our principles of integration. The principle Mrs. Whitehead Gould is helping us to form is that a contract should not be placed before a mother's relationship with her child. She also has clearly established that the so-called surrogate mother is not a surrogate but the real mother and retains that role until she freely relinquishes it after the child is born. There is a certain schizophrenia, it seemed to me, in the New Jersey Supreme Court decision uh, between viewing surrogacy contracts as illegal and viewing them as simply unenforceable. It seemed to me that if the court really believed that paid surrogacy contracts violated public policy, it should have adopted a solution that would truly discourage people from entering into surrogacy contracts and that would not have allowed the Stearns to achieve the intended fruits of their contract uh, after holding it to be illegal. Much of the Supreme Court's language talked as though uh, the normal solution in paid surrogacy contracts from this time forward would be a custody contest between the mother and the father of the child uh, in which the mother and the father were presumed to have equal rights. It is not a satisfactory resolution of the surrogacy problem to resolve these disputes in a custody contest. There probably is no more painful way to decide who will be the custodian of the child than having a custody contest. And as the, as the Whitehead-Stern litigation reveals, 
the class prejudices of the judiciary, uh, the prejudices for the person with the greater wealth, who indeed has more strategic choices in the litigation anyway, uh, and the person who is better educated and indeed seems the most middle class would make it very likely that the father would prevail in the vast majority of surrogacy arrangements. So to say that paid surrogacy is out, but that the custodian will be determined by a custody contest between the mother and the father is not really doing very much. To say to the surrogate mother that the contract is unenforceable, but still she must show in protracted litigation that she is the better parent is not to give the surrogate mother very much chance of custody. And one might worry that in this situation, even though paid surrogacy is technically illegal, that nonetheless a father might enter into such an arrangement believing that the surrogate would probably go through with it and realizing that even if the surrogate changed her mind that he probably would win on the basis of best interests of the child. Mr. Cassidy informs me that this will not be a problem in the future in New Jersey because of because the New Jersey Supreme Court indicated that in the future, pendente lite, that the mother would retain custody of the child unless she was shown to be unfit. I think this, uh, this does carry out the promise of the New Jersey court in holding the contracts illegal, and it does remove much of the incentive for contracting couples to hire women to bear a baby for them. However that may be, Mrs. Whitehead Gould has accepted the Supreme Court's decision and indeed has been conciliatory in this matter from the outset. One is reminded of the parable of Solomon. In the parable of Solomon, two women claimed to be the mother of a baby. Solomon said that since there was no way to decide between them, he would simply cut the baby in half. One woman protested and Solomon then knew that she was the real mother. What Mrs. Whitehead Gould has fought for, or has fought against, was total deprivation of her child. But during the litigation, she offered to accept visitation, and the New Jersey Supreme Court has now given her the right of visitation. She could challenge the Supreme Court award of custody to the Stearns, but instead she is accepting it. This reflects a sound judgment that the best interests of baby M at this time require an end to litigation and the beginning of rebuilding a relationship between the Whitehead Gould family and the Stern family. If the parties are to share the parenting of baby M, as the New Jersey Supreme Court has said they should, with custody in the father and the mother having visitation rights, the best solution for the baby and for everybody else is for the parties to forge a new relationship, to learn to be considerate and respectful of each other, and even perhaps to become friends. Hopefully, without further litigation, the Stearns can learn from Mrs. Whitehead Gould in this respect. I'm delighted to introduce Mr. Cassidy. Thank you for being with us tonight. What I'd like to do is uh, make a, a statement to, to place this case a little bit in an historical context. I'd then like to discuss the holding of the Supreme Court, some of the reasoning of the Supreme Court, knowing that there are some law students here. And then I'd like to address another issue that I think is very important as to where we're going to go from here. What this, can I be heard? I see. What this case was about was an attempt to induce a woman to give away her baby and to shut that woman out of the life of that child forever. Placing this in an historical context, we have had in this country for the past 60 or 70 years adoption laws. And the fundamental purpose of those laws is to find homes for children who need homes. We have never, ever, during that period of time, had a shortage of people who would like to take advantage of women who would, people who would like children and mothers who are carrying children. We've never been at a loss for baby brokers. There has been and there has developed many pressures brought upon women to give up their children. Pressures such as inducements with money, 
pressures such as telling them how altruistic they are if they would do something nice for others, pressures that are brought to bear by arguing that they have obligations to give up the child, and arguments that the baby is better off without them. Historically, there have always been people who would like someone else's baby, and historically, there have always been pressures. But in every state in this union, there have been policies that have been adopted to protect against that type of behavior and against baby brokers. The policies that have been carefully developed in all states is to forbid inducement to surrender a child with money, to disfavor private adoptions and to create an agency system whereby uh, women have the right to be counseled to ensure that she makes a free, knowing, and intelligent decision, free from inducement and free from pressure. Policies have been adopted that no surrender would ever be taken before the birth of a child in every state. That's the policy. Policies have been created in virtually every state that even after the birth of a child, when a woman decides that she's going to surrender her child, she has the right to change her mind. Surrogacy is nothing other than the latest effort by people who would like to get, induce women to give them their children, only it has a new hook, and it has a new twist, and it creates new complications, and it creates new types of pressures and new senses of obligation. Before I argued this case in the Supreme Court, about two days before, I received a telephone call from a federal judge who, it turns out, was a woman who had surrendered a child to adoption. Now, I had heard many, many stories from many, many different women about what it was like after they surrendered a child. And I've spoken to many adoptees about what their experiences are, some good, some not so good. This federal judge wanted to know if we had put in the record anywhere and whether we had ever argued the harm that befalls a woman and the suffering of a child, potentially, as a result of a separation between a mother and a baby. And I told the judge that, of course, we did. But she was surprised because there wasn't anything in Harvey Sorkow's opinion that referred to it. And what she said to me was, isn't it amazing and shocking that people want to do this on purpose? That it's bad enough that there are those of us who are separated from our children out of necessity. And it's bad enough that there are children who are separated from their mothers out of necessity. Isn't it shocking, she says, that they want to do it on purpose? The Supreme Court opinion, really, when you get an opportunity to read it, is a recitation of the existing laws built in to fend off these kind of pressures. They find that the surrogacy agreement is really nothing other than an attempt to circumvent the adoption laws and an attempt to circumvent existing laws dealing with termination of parental rights. And they struck the contract down for approximately eight separate reasons. Either it was in contravention of existing statutes or it was in contravention of existing public policy. Number one, the mother has an absolute right to revoke her consent to surrender a baby. Now, in every state in the union, it's true that surrender documents and written Acknowledgements of a desire to surrender a child will not be taken before the birth of a child. The Supreme Court found in most states there can be a change of mind even when that happens. The Supreme Court found the first reason the contract had to be declared unenforceable was it ran afoul of the statutory scheme that gave a woman a right to control her own destiny and the destiny of a child once the baby was a living, breathing human being. The court stated 
There is no doubt that a contractual provision purporting to constitute an irrevocable agreement to surrender custody of a child for adoption is invalid. They found, much to my delight, that consents prior to birth as a matter of law are uninformed. Second reason, the court found that there can't be termination of parental rights unless there's clear and convincing proof that the woman is unfit, either she abandoned the child or there's substantial neglect of the child. The third reason, that's a violation of the statute prohibiting payment of, or accepting money uh, for an adoption. And the, and the court found that the whole concept of the offering of money permeates the entire arrangement and there's no question that money is an inducement in the arrangement, citing that both sides admit that if you take money out of the transaction, the supply of women who are going to be willing to engage in this arrangement is going to dry up. The court stated, almost every evil that promoted the prohibition of the payment of money in connection with adoption exists here. There are, in a civilized society, some things that money cannot buy. The court then listed additional policies that the contract violated. One, it ignores the child. And the whole purpose and the whole foundation, the whole purpose of our child welfare laws is for the benefit of the child. A surrogacy agreement for the first time in the United States of America wants to take into consideration the adults without taking any consideration of the child whatsoever. It doesn't consider the child's interests. Two, the surrogacy contract guarantees permanent separation of the child from one of its natural parents. And the court went on to state that it's our policy, and has long been our policy, that to the extent possible, children should remain with and be brought up by both of their natural parents. Surrogacy is the creation of a new class of people who don't have the opportunities that others have, and that is some chance in life to grow up with both natural parents. Three, the mother must be given adequate and good advice. All of the states have agencies that are licensed and controlled by the state, and one of their main functions is to give the woman advice as to what she can expect. By definition of Noel Keene and others who are proposing that surrogacy be a way of life in the United States, they define a successful surrogacy arrangement as one where they get the baby. They snatch up the offer. That's a success. They have yet to focus on what happens to that woman later in life or what happens to the child later in life. There's nothing successful about any of these agreements or any of these arrangements that we know of. Next, contrary to the policy the court found that the best interest of the child is paramount since there is no determination, among other things, of the effect upon the child of not living with her natural mother. And of course, we had some great discussions about the evidence there is that there is potential harm to children, per se, who do not have the opportunity to grow up with the mother, which has always been a, a sacred relationship in our society. Next, the court found that the contract guarantees the separation of the child from the mother itself, if it were to be enforced that it looks to adoption regardless of whether it's suitable, and that it is a potential degradation of some women that may result from this arrangement. The court also noted that literature in related areas suggests that long-term effects of surrogacy may be harmful. The court concluded it was in violation of the statutes, it was in violation of all the public policies that it, it cited, and the court concluded that the harmful consequences of the surrogacy arrangement appear to us all too palatable. In New Jersey, the contracts are void, concluding that the enforceability, the irrevocability, and the use of money to achieve the result infects the entire agreement. There were some ultimate questions that were left unanswered by the Supreme Court decision. 
there were in all four constitutional issues that were presented. The one constitutional issue that was decided by the court was that the fundamental right to procreate uh, is not a ban or it does not render unconstitutional the existing statutory scheme that makes it unenforceable. And the, con the, the court did not get to a couple other questions because it, they didn't have to decide them. One of the questions they didn't have to decide was uh, whether there can be a constitutional ban on all surrogacy. They never reached that question. They didn't have to. However, they did allow themselves, and this was extra extraordinary, to give some guidance to legislatures by doing a legal analysis of what, what the legal analysis might look like if they had uh, uh, discussed the question. And in essence, what they said was you have to identify what public policies there would be to justify a ban, citing the policy that we have that a child should grow up with both parents uh, and the like types of policies, and analyzing uh, uh, the Roe v. Wade decision that brought into question or into focus the effect it would have on third parties. Uh, and here, the third party, of course, would be the child born of the arrangement. So the court seemed to suggest that a ban on all surrogacy, if you take the money out, if you take the irrevocability out, if you take all the other problems out of it, that if a legislature were to pass a statute that says no form of surrogacy of any type uh, it will be allowed in our state, that probably it would cut constitutional muster. The next question was whether whether to allow surrogacy. The other, the flip side of the question, if you were to pass a statute that allowed commercialized surrogacy, uh, would that be constitutionally permitted or would it be a constitutional violation of the fundamental right to continued companionship of the child? The suggestion seemed to be clear that uh, any agreement that made it irrevocable would be unconstitutional. That the, the surrender of the child or the binding aspects of the, of, of the woman's determination cannot be made until after the child was born. That's what the analysis seemed to suggest. There's a fourth constitutional question which I'm not going to talk about because depending on how the remand hearing goes, it may become uh, a question once again. Uh, most of you here are going to be lawyers, as I understand it. And uh, lawyers, when, you, when you're out there and you practice, uh, you will find that sometimes lawyers and their clients litigate issues. And sometimes the law schools can't get to argue about the issues and the niceties of the issues if somebody doesn't get in the trenches and litigate them on a very fundamental level. Well, it's very nice that we now have the law that says that it's the right of a woman in a state of New Jersey to revoke a consent following birth. Before I get to that, there's, there's, in order to clarify what was said earlier, we had argued that the Ill illegal nature of the act and the public policies that ought to be a concern that ought to not involve a court in advancing the purpose of a surrogacy contract should result in the court using a best interest definition different from the normal best interest definitions when two natural parents are contesting for custody of the same child. And we argued that the standard that should be adopted is that when those two people come to court, the child should be left with the mother if that's where the child is, unless the mother's unfit. The court rejected that argument on the final custody order, but appears to have accepted it in part in that they have ruled that henceforth in New Jersey, if a woman refuses to surrender a child who was born out of, as a result of a surrogacy arrangement, a father may not be given pendente lite custody unless he makes a showing that the mother is unfit. At the same time, the court retained part of the 10 years doctrine. 
that recognizes the age of the child and the relationship between the mother and child as being sufficiently uh, sensitive that it is a factor to be considered when awarding custody. So the way that I see it, in New Jersey, I don't think that in most situations the, father could the mother can lose uh, custody. Now, I think it's very nice that uh, lawyers uh, take on cases and litigants take on cases that uh, result in clarifying legal issues. But it's one thing to tell a woman that she has the legal right to keep a child. And I don't care if you're talking about a surrogate mother, we're you're talking about a mother where the, a state agency comes in and tries to terminate her rights, or whether she's a woman who surrendered a child for adoption has changed her mind. It's one thing to tell her that she has these rights. It's quite another to see that she has a lawyer to protect them. Right now, there are 27 states, New Jersey included, that says that the fundamental right to enjoy the companionship of your child is sufficiently strong that the constitutional protection runs to supplying that person with a lawyer. The other states are going to have to catch up to that, but no state that uh, New Jersey, I'll confine my discussion to New Jersey on this point, New Jersey does not provide paid lawyers. And I'm telling you, as a lawyer, who does litigation and who sees other lawyers work on an everyday basis, if you don't pay lawyers, you're not getting legal representation. And the Reagan administration took the money out of legal services so that these women, and I've seen it, in these contexts, who were desperately, and Mary Beth Whitehead was one originally, who desperately are in need of representation to protect these rights, these laws that we make, and there are no lawyers who are going to stand up in the everyday case, the next 5,000 cases that follow Mary Beth Whitehead's, for no money, no recognition, and no opportunity to make a contribution to the law. Thank you. Well, first, I'd like to thank everybody for inviting me here. And I guess what everybody wants to hear is why I did it. I did it because I thought that it was something good. I thought that the end result was something good. And as time passed, the nine months during the pregnancy, I realized that it was something horrible. That what I was doing by giving the baby to the Stearns was not helping the Stearns and certainly not helping my baby. When I went to the infertility center in New York, they didn't tell me that it was my baby. They told me it was the couple's baby. And I believed them. I really believed them. And it took me the nine months to kind of undo the brainwashing and the actual pain of the delivery that made me realize that it was my baby that I was giving them. And that's not how it started out. From the beginning, from day one, they always told me it was the couple's baby. They didn't tell me that it was a brother or sister to the two children I had home or a grandchild to my parents. And I guess that the pain really made me realize that at that point, that's what made me change my mind. And then I guess I didn't want to hurt the Stearns. I felt that telling them that they couldn't have the baby was going to hurt them. So I tried in a real nice way to make them realize that it was wrong. But they were desperate and they wanted a child. And I can understand that. And I really don't hold any bad feelings towards them because I realized how desperate they were. I did a lot of things during the whole procedure of keeping my child that I'm not proud of. But I didn't know what else to do. I couldn't get lawyers to help me. I get real emotional. I'm sorry. But I guess what I really want to say to everybody is I'm glad that it's not going to happen to anybody else. And I hope that it never will. Thank you.
people have questions they'd like to ask? I can't believe there's a whole room full of shy people. <laughs> well, since no one else is, <laughs> I'd like to ask um, Mr. Cassidy, um, aren't your arguments somewhat insensitive to the feelings of adopted children that you can be raised by someone other than your natural mother and grow up normally no. and have a normal adjustment? No. I, the, don't misinterpret what's being said. There are many, many successful adoptions, and adoption is a good thing, but it's a last resort. And the people who are in the adoption industry, if you will call it that, will tell you so. Because adoption works out well in many cases does not mean that children who are adopted are at risks that other children are not at, and that's the point. And it would be, I would suggest to you that children who are born out of a surrogacy arrangement are at even increased risk than children who are adopted, who are, and the statistics will bear out, are at increased risk than the general population. Hope that answers your question. Cool. Any other questions that you'd like to address to Mary Beth or myself? We can hear you if you shout. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as, as you know, as a law student, equal protection doesn't mean that uh, identical treatment and people similarly situated are to be treated in the same way. Uh, women who uh, certainly can be just as good a lawyers as men, but for you to say that in childbearing, the role of the father is identical to the role of the mother is absurd. And what the court in the case referred to, and they did cite it, is the well-documented phenomenon that a woman bonds to a child during pregnancy. Men don't get pregnant if you don't, if you, that's the point. And women, women do bond to their child during the pregnancy, and it happens to be an experience, it's a lovely experience that us men don't get to enjoy. But it also, there is some suggestion in the literature that the bonding of the child act to the mother, some people say that begins during the pregnancy. There's a dispute in the medical community about that. However, in the medical community, it's accepted widely that the bonding of the child to the mother does take place within the first two weeks. And that that relationship between the mother and the child bonded back and forth to one another is unique. It does not compare with the bond of the father. And this reality is reflected in case law. If you look at the Lair case, the constant, fundamental constitutional right to enjoyment of continued companionship does not begin with the father at birth. The law does, reflects the, the bonding, and it doesn't begin until there's been a documented relationship between the child and the father. I see. Yeah. Well, I, I can understand when women have fought so hard for so long for equality in the workplace that the last thing they want to do is to be told that uh, their obligation is to, is, to, is to leave the workplace, and no one would suggest that. Um, but to say, that as a matter of fact, that the bonding does not take place is just a misstatement of fact. <clears throat> the, the support groups that have grown up around the country for women who have lost children from, to adoption are 
100% female members. There are no male members. I think that that says something about the experience of both the male and the female in that situation. Yes, um, I'm very satisfied with the Supreme Court's decision. I feel that me going right now and fighting for custody of the baby would just be doing exactly what was done to her at four months old, and I don't want to be a part of that. I think that she was hurt, traumatized at four months, and I don't want to do that to her at 22 months. I feel that the process has to be slow, that eventually, as long as she knows who I am, that she has a brother and a sister, she has grandparents that love her, that's all I want. I'm not asking for her back. I mean, I just want to be her mother. That's all I've ever asked for from the very beginning. I think... What do you say to her about this? How do you explain this whole scenario? Be careful, that's going to be the subject matter. Excuse me, that's going to be the subject matter of an upcoming hearing, and as a, I'm going to act as a lawyer now and ask her not to answer that what question. To, uh, Absolutely. Is the of yes. Harvey Sorkow decided that he, he, he projected that the Stearns might explain it better, and he held it against Mary. Could, Mr. Cassidy, could you explain that part, how the court decided that, the part about the, um, about the best interest of the child again? I don't understand, because you said that the standard from now on would be if the mother was found to be unfit. No, don't, don't, I don't, let me make it clear, be certainly clear. In, <laughs> in, in a normal custody dispute where two natural parents of a child are seeking the custody of their baby, whether the child is born by normal means or by artificial insemination doesn't matter. The old standard of best interest of the child that the, and, and how the court defines it remains in place and undisturbed. In the future in New Jersey, in the context of a child being born out of a surrogacy contract, where the, child, where the child's mother decides that she will not surrender the child following the child's birth, if a father makes an application pendente lite, that is during the pendency of the litigation, for custody, custody cannot be awarded to that father unless he makes a showing that the mother is unfit. I guess my question then is how did they decide this case? They this case, okay, this case, was, they, they reserved on the, on the ultimate issue of where the placement's going to be once there's a full hearing. They decided the case on just the, the traditional best interest standard. And that the right to custody of the child is equal between the mother and the father. Okay, they did retain, however, part of what we call the tender years doctrine, which recognizes the bonding and which recognizes that the age of the child um, uh, is to be considered. And, and back there, if the mother doesn't want the custody of the child, she doesn't have to take the custody of the child. It just recognizes the fact that where the mother does want the custody of the child, and where the mother is advancing that it's in the best interest of the child, the court cannot ignore the fact that there's a very real bond, and when a child is of tender years, that that bond has to be taken into consideration, and the bond is different from the bond to the father. Okay. Mrs. Gould, I understand you were, as part of the contract, we paid $10,000. You did not take the 10000 I wanted to, uh, perhaps you'd explain when you made that decision and why. The money was never important to me. From the day that I met the Stearns, I told them that I would have done it for no money. Uh, it was important to my ex-husband. He didn't want the inconvenience to himself and to my other two children. And then I think when Sarah was born, I think that he realized that he was selling Ryan and Tuesday's sister for $10,000. So the money wasn't important to him anymore either. 
I never wanted the money. I w wouldn't take the money now, and I didn't take it then. Um, Mr. Cassidy, it seems to me that your argument and the decision of the court um, is based upon the assumption that at four months old, there is a child and not a fetus. And um, I'm wondering how, what kind of impact that would have on um, abortion rights for women. None whatsoever. And uh, let me make a statement on that and begin by saying that I will not make a public statement on whether abortion is good or bad. Abortion is legal. There are some people who want to do away with abortion to increase available children for adoption, which I find rather bizarre. It's just another form of surrogacy. And I think that the women in this country have already decided they don't want to be surrogate mothers. Some abort a child, others who choose not to do that, and they, they choose to keep the baby once the baby is born. And that's the reason why the whole concept of surrogacy even arises, because women are making the statement that they don't want to carry children to give away to somebody else. I don't see that it in any way uh, affects the right of a woman to choose an abortion. Um, I'm under the impression, however, that the opponents of abortion argue that abortion should be illegal because the fetus is a child, and that that is... That's not, that issue doesn't come up in this case. The only place it comes up is the people It, who it say, doesn't come up in this case, but it seems to be another case that is, a, that is affirming that a fetus is a child before birth. I, I don't see it that way, except to the extent that the court pointed out in what I think is dictum, that the U.S. Supreme Court has already said that at some point, the society's interest in preserving the child. The fetus reaches a certain age, and at some point, society's interest becomes greater than the woman's interest to control her own body, so to speak. To the extent, to that extent, yes, the court commented on that, and I think that the comment uh, would infer that once a child is, uh, uh, they use the reverse argument that this is an argument uh, which would make it illegal to ban uh, her right to revoke consent following birth. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Gould, um, I have a question. There, there are many areas of reproductive technology that the Supreme Court decision in New Jersey does not, uh, did not reach, um, one of which would be a, a case in which a couple um, could conceive a child, um, but could, the woman could not carry that child to term. Uh, were that child then implanted in, in the womb of a surrogate, is that something that you also um, would be against? And could you discuss the differences, perhaps, uh, to you, in, if that were the case? That's not what it was. You know. No, I understand that. <laughs> I, I know that, and I really can't predict how I would feel about that. I don't know if it's the nine months that you carry it, or if it's your egg, or if it's... I really don't know how I would feel. I mean, it's your blood, it's your fruits of your labor that make that baby. And I'm not real sure if I would have felt the same way if it wasn't my egg. I really don't know. Mr. Cassidy, would you address maybe the, how you think the court's decision would my affect own, things like in vitro fertilization? My own reading of whatever medical information is available is that we can't expect that the woman's reaction to the baby will be any different if she carries somebody else's egg. Uh, and I think the idea of using her as a human incubator and then discarding her later without regard for how she's going to feel about that later in life uh, and without her ability to predict how she's going to feel about it, I think is uh, potentially degrading and inhumane. Uh, I'd like to follow up on the point about bonding that someone raised over there, and if you allow her to comment on my comment. Um, I agree that... <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Um, I agree that the, the bond between a mother and a child is different than a bond between a, the father and the child, but you've already had two children, and you'd already had a pregnancy, and you'd already experienced the bond between a mother and a child, and I don't 
see how all of a sudden this one was so different and I don't really understand how you didn't kind of see this coming and how you would agree to do something like this in the first place, knowing the bond. I was 17 when I had my son, who is now 13. I was 19 when I had my daughter. I was really done having children, I thought. And I guess because I was so young, I didn't see that bond. I mean, I love them no differently than I love, you know, the baby. But I that. At that point, at 17 and 19, it was a lot different than having a child at 28. I was more ready. I was more in touch. At 17 and 19, I wasn't. And don't misunderstand me. I love my first two children as much as I love the third. But it was different, much, much different. I had forgotten all the, the joys. I only looked at all the bad. And I think the infertility center helped me look at all the bad. You know, they didn't tell me that I was going to love this baby and I was going to love all the things that, I guess, that's involved in raising a baby. All they told me about was the bad, that I didn't have to get up at night and feed it. I, you know, it was all the bad. I didn't hear any of the good. So then, is it correct? Are, are you suggesting then that uh, every woman doesn't have this bond that the whole case no. seems to be riding on. No, 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 no. I'm not suggesting but that at all. I'm, I, what I'm trying to explain to you is that I was very young when I had my first two children. And then at 28, I was more in touch with my feelings. I was more ready for a child at 28 than I was at 17 and 19. And I think that's why I got involved in it in the first place, because I had missed out on so much at 17 and 19. It was a burden having a child at 17 and 19. My children are 17 months apart. I mean, I couldn't wait until they were old enough that they were going to be a little bit more independent. It was like having two infants, and I, I, was, a, I was a child myself. Thank you. You're welcome. So I have a question for you, Ms. Gould, about your future plans. Do you want to just finish litigating your case in New Jersey and then go back to private life? Or because you have become essentially a national symbol for the debate over this issue, do you plan to maybe go to other states and speak out and lobby for legislation banning surrogate parenting? I really haven't given it a whole lot of thought about what the future will, will bring. I'm not very good at predicting the future, as, as you've seen. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I'm just going to, I really would like to, I have a new life and I'm really looking forward to the baby that I'm carrying. I'm looking forward to having the baby come home. Um, I'm looking, there, there's an awful lot that I, I think that I should say about the Stearns and I. I think that a lot of people are looking at it that I hold a, a lot against them and maybe a real small piece of me does, but I'm willing to, to call for all of us to try to heal one another and kind of start over and try to put the bad feelings behind us for the baby's sake. Um, and if, it, if, it, if I have to call her Melissa, I will do so. Um, Sarah's been kind of special to me. I, I named her that. But um, I really feel that uh, if it's for the best interest of her to call her Melissa, I will do it. And my other two children will do it too. Thank you. Pardon me? <laughs> no, I'm still emotional. Uh, it's, it's hard. I have a question for... for sure. For Mr. Cassidy? Yes. If, um, if I go down to the Harvard Clinic and sell my sperm for 50 bucks, <laughs> and then I find out, despite all the confidentiality rules, that uh, a, a child, a newly born child, is, is my son. Does this opinion have any effect at all on, on my rights as a father? Or no. is it only limited to the, uh, the bonding that you keep on talking about? No. The, the situation you're talking about has been addressed by statute, and there hasn't been a successful constitutional attack against it. That uh, the rights of that father has been cut off by statute. Uh, there has been no, no successful attack against that. So, so basically, this whole opinion rests upon the pregnancy. It doesn't rest upon any moral or legal right that um, Mrs. Gould is the mother, just as I would be the father 
but it's just because she carried the baby to term. And, and so all the legal rights rest upon that. Is that right? No. Uh, Can I comment on that just because? <laughs> she thinks that's a big contribution, and the court did comment on the contribution of sperm versus carrying a child and having the bonding, et cetera. But what the, what the case really is is a legal analysis of existing law dealing with termination of parental rights, dealing with adoption, right of a mother to revoke her consent to adoption, uh, and like in the public policies that have protected, you know, traditionally and historically, the pressures brought to bear are always brought to get, bear against the mother because the person who has babies to sell in this society, in reality, are women who bear them. Those fathers don't even exist. They're nowhere around, historically. We don't know who they are and they don't come forward, historically. The mother's left holding the bag, historically. So historically, the laws protect women because the women are the ones who were preyed upon. Um, I guess addressing three different people, all this, this bonding issue, um, I think it's a very important, first of all, to make a distinction between uh, a child that is conceived out of intercourse and where the man is there for the nine months giving support to the woman and giving love to that child, which I think you can do while it is still right. a fetus, uh, and artificial insemination, and when the man is nowhere to be found when you are going through the nine months. I guess a question that I, I can ask rather than just making this a statement is, did Mr. Stern ever have have any contact, give you any support during those nine months, have any contact with the, with the child? No, I can't say he didn't have any contact, <laughs> but he was not there. My ex-husband was there through it all, morning sickness, delivery. And, you know, that's why I think that I always felt that I had more of a right than Bill Stern, because he wasn't there. In a sense, in the beginning, he was truly a sperm donor. But Harvey Sorkel has made him a father. Right. I would like to preface my remarks by saying that I I've, um, believe Mrs. Gould has the right to a child, and I believe perhaps that she should have received custody. But addressing Mr. Cassidy, Justice Holmes once said that to base a decision on history is, to paraphrase, is illogical. And as a man, and uh, as a father, which I, which I hope to be someday, I would refute. <laughs> I would refute the premise that I, as a father, would not have a bond with my child. It may not be as great. It may not have the physical relationship that a mother and child has. But if we're talking about equal protection of the laws, and perhaps uh, Professor Field, uh, as a constitutional expert, could address this. I, I'm having difficulty with the premise that the father does not also have a constitutional right. Oh, they and do. to base it on history, as Justice Holmes okay. has said, is illogical. Okay, uh, they do. Then let me let me. <laughs> the the opinion clearly states that the the right to custody of a father is equal to that of a mother. But. When, when the litigants come to court, there's a certain history, if you will, with the child. And the child is a certain age. And the nature of the bond with the father and the child may be different when the child is six months old and when the child is 12 months, years old. It's dramatically different. All we've talked about and all that the court mentioned is when the child is very young, the bond between the mother and the child is different and it's unique. And that should not be ignored or forgotten. No one would suggest that the right of the father is anything other than equal. The Supreme Court decision said so. I'm not refuting your premise, and I am I'm 100% agreement with you. But perhaps we can imagine a scenario where a man and a woman were married. The man got the, the woman pregnant, very much wanted the child. Something happened during pregnancy in which they were split, divided, the woman left, or the man, uh, something happened in which the child, the father had no contact with the child until they went to litigation. The child reaches ages uh, because that litigation is taken. Uh, 
years under your premise, because the, child, the father has not had contact with the child, he would not have a right, a constitutional right, and I would believe that would violate the equal protection of the law. No, 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 no. Then you misunderstand what's being said. Nobody says that he doesn't have a constitutional right. He has a cons the, the father has a constitutional right to continue companionship of a child. He has an equal right to custody. But when you're talking about what's in the best interest of the child, Certainly, if the child's been with the mother for three years, I can assure you that there wouldn't be a judge around that would give the custody of the child to the father under such circumstances because they wouldn't ignore the bond that took place. Okay, thank you very much. I have a question for Mr. Cassidy. As you say that a surrogate contract is by nature uninformed on the, for the part of the, the surrogate mother to revoke her consent, would you also agree that, that if after the child is born and the surrogate is agreeable to, to giving up the, the child that the parents, the, in this case the, the equivalent of the Stearns, would also have the right to revoke okay. to change their mind since they were equally uninformed? What I, was, what I was telling you is what was in the Supreme Court opinion. They found as a matter of law that a decision to surrender a child prior to birth is uninformed. That is something that I was pressing for, and that is a statement that the court made. Uh, nobody could make the Stearns take custody, and nobody can take, make the mother take custody. If you have a situation, like, like in the surrogacy agreement, where nobody wanted the child, no one can make them take the child. The child will become a ward of the state. Does that answer your question? And you agree that that would be within their rights to revoke their consent to the contract? They point. reserved that right by the terms of the contract. That was one of the unfair aspects of the contract, that the contract required Mrs. Whitehead to surrender the, the child for adoption, but there was no burden on Stern to take the custody of the child if he decided he didn't want to take custody of the child. Thank you. When will uh, visitation rights be settled, and what will you accept, and what won't you accept? And Mrs. Gould, since you said your ex-husband was more supportive during your pregnancy than Mr. Stern, will you allow him to play a role in Melissa's life? Um, firstly, we won't talk about what we're going to discuss in settlement discussions, and I do hope there will be settlement discussions. Um, and she can answer the other one. Yeah, um, I don't know. What question was it, Don? Um, <laughs> since you said, since you called Mr. Stern a sperm donor, uh, and no, no, that no, he no. played, I well, said in the beginning, he's oh, not. Now right. he is her father. Don't misunderstand. Right. Me. That that he wasn't as supportive as your ex-husband during your pregnancy. I was wondering, after the visitation rights are settled, do you intend to allow your ex-husband to play any role in Melissa's life? I I guess I do. Um, I see my ex-husband, my other two children see my ex-husband, and I, yes I do, he loves her very much. And I can't see how that can hurt her that she's got five people loving her instead of two. I have a question for Mr. Cassidy at this point. You made some statements in your opening remarks that were very grave and somewhat emotionally laden about the public policy involved with having the natural parents raise the child. And I want to know what impact this has on unwed parents, teenage parents, are you going to insist that they get married or that they somehow live together, what impact it has on a woman who gets pregnant and wants to raise the child on her own, leaving the father out of it, and what impact it would have on divorce laws, which allow parents to split up in a marriage for their own safety, for their own sakes, for their own mental stability, and perhaps for the good of the child. I think, I think it has a lot of, a lot of impact on, if, if you're saying that I don't think it has any impact on any of that. I think that... <laughs> What, what the court said, not me, but what the court said was that it is the policy of the state of New Jersey, where possible, to see that the child is raised by both parents. Why? But that's a goal. That's a goal. The goal isn't to start out by seeing that a child can only be raised by one parent or the other. If that happens, because of the conduct of the adults or circumstances beyond the control of the state, then it happens. But it's not a goal of the state, and shouldn't be. Why can't this be considered to be circumstances beyond the control of the state? The, um, if the state were to say 
that it's our policy. If, they, if the New Jersey or any other state in the union were to say it's our policy, that we think it's a bad idea to plan in advance the abandonment of a child, and therefore we are going to pass a statute that's going to prohibit it, I think that it would be withstand constitutional challenge because that would be a legitimate goal. If you think that's not a legitimate goal, then, then you are outside the mainstream of legal thought as it now exists. It's cold out here, but... Um. <laughs> I wondered if, if Mr. Cassidy could speak to the issue of whether in in the event, you're, it, prospectively, where a father could challenge custody on the basis only of the fitness of the mother, whether the fact that she entered into a surrogacy contract can be used to, to discredit her quote-unquote fitness as a parent. The New Jersey Supreme Court specifically stated that entering into the contract cannot be used against her on, on visitation. Anyone else? Thank you for coming. <laughs>